Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of In the Swamp with Ogre. Today, we have my good friend, John Sanders with Chicago Title. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Ed. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I appreciate you being on with us. Um, so, John, can you tell us a little bit about how long you've been with Chicago and, and kind of what you what you did before you got to Chicago Title? Yeah, absolutely. So I started with Chicago Title roughly in 2005. Um, and ironically enough, they were they were in a bit of a hiring freeze. And so technically, they could not hire me back then. Um, so I came on as a consultant and I worked for roughly the first 12 months of being with Chicago Title and uh, not even technically as an employee. But I was able to generate some business and bring in some business through the door. Um, so they saw some value in me and more so maybe than perhaps some of the other sales team that weren't bringing in opportunities or deals. And so they're like, you know what, we, we can't really let go of a, a guy that's, that's generating business for us. So we gotta, we gotta hire this guy. Cause if not, he's gonna, he's gonna go somewhere else. And so, uh, I was extremely fortunate that uh, the management team at Chicago Title saw some value in me to uh, to hire me, take a shot on a guy that had, had never been in sales before. I did not even really know what title insurance was. It was kind of one of those things they throw you out and uh, go get business. But, you know, for me, I, I was not born and raised, but I, I really was brought up in the service industry and ultimately it was as a golf professional i played golf in high school tried to play golf professionally ultimately landed uh, as a club professional in northern california and that really laid the foundation for me in in understanding just service customer service whether it be servicing the golfers that show up at the golf course or the members of the club, uh, or even you know the other employees that were part of the club that I was working at. It laid this foundation of service, and ultimately one thing led to another. I moved to New York and was a golf pro there for five years, and then ultimately came out here and was the golf pro at Anthem Country Club. And all along the way, everything continued to build one brick on top of another on this idea of just being of service to others, helping in whatever way that I could. And so when I had title role, although it was an entirely different world, it, it there could not have been more polar opposites as to the two things. What I always had to fall back on was just servicing other people. How can I help? How can I be of service? And so although they were completely different, they really tied closely into one another just because I was able to identify a need and help people. So you were a golf pro. So let me get, let me go on that for one second. Can you teach anybody how to play golf? Uh, no, I'm not a miracle worker. Uh, <laughs> I cannot teach anybody how to golf. I can teach most people how to golf. But, you know, Ed, I'll tell you, I would tell my students all the time, learning how to play golf is very much like in elementary school, whenever on Monday, your teacher would pass out the spelling words on Monday and give you a test on Friday. If you didn't study the words Monday through Thursday, you were going to fail the test on Friday. Right. I didn't go out and teach you the fundamentals of golf all day long. But if you're not going to make time and commit to, to actually playing, you're not going to be very good. And it actually translates over into pretty much anything it, it, that, you, that you can think about, right? Like it could be parenting. It could be being a better husband. It could be a better cook. It could be anything, better title, sales executive, a better agent, all those things. If we don't invest the time, like we might have an idea that we want to be better at something, but if you don't commit to doing it, you're not going to get better. So right. I can help you if you commit to wanting to help yourself. <laughs> Because I don't play golf. Um, I know a lot of people that do, like yourself. and uh, uh, I know clients that do all the time. They come in town just to play golf. Um, but I don't at all. Um, so maybe we have to talk about that at some point and figure out how you can show me a little bit of that. Um, but, but I know that you are committed to self-mastery. Um, and you are always constantly looking for new books, how to better yourself, how to provide more service to us as your clients. And, you know, recommend books or recommend events or recommend things. So what got you on this, this trajectory towards self-mastery? Well, I got to admit, Ed, I was not a very good student. Um, I was 
really into sports as a kid growing up. I did not want to study. I did not want to spend time reading, doing all of those things. I did the bare minimum to basically get the grades necessary so that I could stay eligible on my, my high school team or college golf or, or whatever the case might be. And I, I can't give you an exact date to it, but call it, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I really got into this idea that like, I need to improve myself because if I can improve myself, then I can help others improve themselves. Um, not in a direct way, but just in a, hey, do it for me and maybe by proxy it will push out to others. And so I started reading a little bit. I'm still not the greatest when it comes to sitting down and reading a book. I love Audible. I love podcasts. I love, I mean, we drive around all the time. And so if I can listen to a book 20 or 30 minutes at a time, or I can listen to a self-help podcast uh, and hit, you know, on repeat over and over, um, it has made such an impact in my life, Ed, and I think that you would you would kind of echo some of those sentiments. But um, it's it's not that I remember everything, but as I'm driving around and something just really hits me, I, I make a point to either type it in my phone as a note or or write it down in my notepad because there's just certain things that it might not be 300 pages of a book that impacts me, but there might be a paragraph that just rocks my world and changes everything. And, and I can rattle off two or three or four um, quotes, if you will, from books that I just kind of think back on and think that is, I need that. It's talking to me. I need that information. So it's, it's a work in progress, man. I, I can't proclaim that I have, I have uh, turned the corner on it whatsoever, but I, I have finally at the ripe old age of 46, really come to the understanding that above all things, it's self-improvement because I need to take care of myself first and foremost. Right, and I totally agree. So um, you did it younger than I did because you did it at 46, I'm at 49. I'm, I'm, now is when I'm really buying into it. But I start my day off with, with you know, Tony Robbins and uh, Joel Osteen and, and different types of, hey, you know, have faith, go forward. And, and, and Steve Harvey, a lot of it is just following your heart and doing the right thing. And I think everything falls into place. And then, and then I do follow it up with, the, with obviously, the books and, and Audible. I try to listen to that as much as possible. And you're right. It's just if you try to, to in, use the entire book to your future and how, am I, how can I apply this, it's kind of tough. But catching one or two things and saying, oh, you know what? I, if I implement this in my business or in my personal life, it'll change everything. Absolutely. I'll tell you something I've really been focused on. A friend of mine put out the other day, um, it said, uh, uh, perfection is poison. And one of the things that I struggle with most is this idea that I believe everything I do has to be perfect. Um, a sales presentation, the way that I talk with you on this podcast, all of the things that I do I need to be perfect. And in, in doing so, I, I essentially paralyzed myself from taking action because it's never going to be perfect. And that's something I'm really thinking about right now. Another one is done is better than perfect. Because again, if I have a task to do, whether it's, you know, making 10 sales calls or putting together a presentation Done is better than perfect. I can work on it and make it better. But if my goal is perfect, I'm never going to publish it. I'm never going to make that call. And, and even if I were to make that call and it didn't go to my satisfaction, I would look at it as though I was a failure because it didn't live up to my expectation. And we're our own worst critics all the time. I can tell you a hundred things that I did wrong versus the five things that I did right. And that self-talk in our brain of all the things we did wrong instead of the few things that maybe we did right. I mean, if you allow it, it can cripple you. It can crush you. Um, so those are just two things right off the bat the last couple of weeks that I've really been focusing on. Um, and it's, it's not like I have, uh, you know, daily affirmations, although I do have some things that I meditate on or I think on or I pray on. Um, but recently it's really been, it's, it's perfect as poison done is better than perfect and just get it done. So um, that's what I'm thinking about right now, man. So, so I went to, uh, I've seen one of my favorite people that I've seen live 
is John Chiblick. Yep. And and the two times I've seen him live, he said this, and it resonates um, with me personally because I'm I'm the same. I, I'm not a perfectionist, but if I don't know it enough, I don't want to do it. Or if I um, am not comfortable with it, like getting out of my comfort zone is difficult. Um, I like doing real estate. I like what I do and I like to help people. But let, let me stay in my lane. Don't, don't do a podcast because you don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know this. You don't know that. So, And one of, one of the things that he says, and he said it at both events and he says it all the time is, your bad content will outproduce anyone's non-existing content every time. Yep. I actually saw him in San Diego last October at a great event uh, that was put on. And first of all, that dude is intense. Yes. He's ripped. He is like scary. And he walked right up to the table and we made eye contact for a second. And I thought I was just going to melt. Like that dude could be scary. <laughs> Uh, by the way, he's a Vegas guy. He lives here. Yeah. Now. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but anyway, he scared he scared me to death. But you're absolutely right. It's it's I mean, the content you push out is a whole lot better than the content somebody's thinking about, but never puts out. And, and that's a great nugget in the sense that you talk about the, a day and age right now where um, video is something that we need to embrace. We need to push out there. Um, and everybody is afraid of it. And so many push themselves away from it or resist it. And, and I was that way for a long time, but it was just like, you know what, heck with it. I need to do this. And I don't care about the haters. I care about those that are gonna get something from it. And in the back of my mind, when I'm doing my podcast or I'm doing your show or I'm doing other things like, you know what, there might be one or two people that take something good away from what I'm about to say. Those are the ones I'm gonna focus on not the five or six or 10 or 500, who knows however many it is, that say, what the hell's Sanders doing? Like, why is he doing that? I'm not worried about the haters anymore. I can't control what they think. I'm just gonna do what, I'm gonna do me and do it to the best that I can. You know, one, one of the funny things uh, about that whole, this whole topic is um, that, uh, that I put it out and I'm still playing around with the sound and the recordings and some of them come out decent, some come out need a lot of work. The worst sound on any of my podcasts so far had the most likes, the most views, and the most comments on YouTube, which is amazing because I heard the sound and I was like, oh my God, this guy's going to kill me. It's, he's, he's just quit his job and started his own business. I'm his first interview into his own business and it's, the sound is horrendous. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it, was, it got him two pieces of business out of it, which is the goal. Is, is to help somebody's business grow and get to know. And so everybody in our local community knows who's around. So it's, it's to help and it worked, but I was petrified. So after that, it's like, I just put it out. If it's good, great. If it's not, I'm sorry. We'll get it better next time. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I don't know if you saw it, but I shared a picture not too long ago about what I call my studio that I'm in right now. To call it a man cave is not even close to, uh, to, to being real. <laughs> Uh, I, I literally, I am set up on an ironing board with two reams of paper holding my computer on top. And, and I put it out to say, you know what? It doesn't care. It doesn't matter what your, your studio looks like. Just record the content, put it out there in hopes that somebody will consume it and like it. And so I keep it as a reminder to, to me like, hey, man, it just doesn't care. Just do it. And and it's good. It's good. Yeah, people like it. So. Uh, let's get back onto onto the topic of the title because <laughs> we could be on this topic for the next hour. Um, but but title. So so you work for Chicago. You do residential, and then you also help me on the commercial side. So how did you get to that side? Yeah. So it's a great story. When I was first hired with Chicago Title, I was hired by uh, who I would consider to be my mentor. His name is Robert Ray. Robert uh, was head of the commercial division for Chicago Title back in the day in, in 2005. We all know how the, the market turned and, and kind of fast forward 15 years. Well, uh, I was fortunate that Robert Ray came back to run what we now call Fidelity NCS. NCS stands for National Commercial Services basically did was it brought together all, all four of the brands for for Fidelity National Title Group. That would be Chicago Title, Tycor Title, Lawyers Title. Um, Chicago Tycor, Lawyers Fidelity, I 
mix them up. Anyway, they brought them all together and Ro Robert oversees all of that and asked me to be part of Fidelity NCS. And it's been a great opportunity because again, I can't walk away from 15 years of relationship building, of helping people, of growing people's business and assisting them with their residential business. But in addition to what I do on the residential side, I can also bring value to many of my relationships, you being one of them, on the commercial side. Uh, so many people get into real estate and they start on the residential side and then they want growth. They I identify opportunities and oftentimes those opportunities come in the way of moving to the commercial side of, of the business. And there's no reason why I could not help you, Ed, on the commercial side in the same way that I would help you and your team on the commercial side. It just it didn't make any sense. So it's been a great opportunity for me to, to be um, in, in both arenas, so to speak, to help people on both sides. And to be honest, there's huge, huge value in understanding both segments of the market, because I think you would agree with me, they're entirely different. Um, yeah. the, the emotional uh, side of residential purchasing or selling versus the uh, economic investment side of the commercial uh, acquisition or disposition it's entirely different. The, the conversations are different. The way you talk with one of your commercial investors is entirely different than the way that you're going to talk with somebody that is uh, looking to buy their very first home, right? Right. Yeah, it's completely different. And and they sometimes a commercial gets a little emotional. Uh, sometimes, but but you're right. It's 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 just numbers. Doesn't do the numbers pan out? Doesn't make sense. If it makes sense, let's move forward. Um. So so now that you do both. What do you see yourself uh, liking better? Or if, if there is one that you say, well, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I, I know the residential so much, but the, I like the diversity of commercial or, or is there one that you would say, yeah, you know what? I really dig this. Yeah. So it's kind of like picking which child do you like more, right? <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> I, I will tell you that the commercial side challenges me more. And I love a challenge. I love to learn. I love to push myself out of my comfort zone. Um, but I also love that residential side because I know that I can take an agent who, you know, is maybe new to the business or is doing, you know, call it less than 10 transactions a year. And I know that if they do the things that I recommend that they do, they can actually grow their business to 20 transactions over the course of the following year. If I can help somebody double their business by giving them three or four best practices, that changes their life. It definitely changes their economic opportunities if they go from seven to 10 deals to 15 to 20 deals, um, whether it be saving them money or giving them opportunities of growth. On the commercial side, it's, it's really about connecting the dots. It's understanding who's doing what, who's looking for this particular product, um, they're much more savvy in what they are doing. They need help, but the way that they need help is quite a bit different than your residential agent. So, um, if you, if you held me to the, to the coals and said, which one would you take? I would take the commercial side only because over the course of the next 15 years, I would love to continue to grow. I, I would say that I, I'm in the second inning of the commercial baseball game versus right. the seventh or eighth inning of the residential side. I don't even know what I don't know sometimes when it comes to the commercial space, but I'm not going to be outworked. I'm going to continue to learn. I'm going to continue to help and provide value to all of those. I just ask for a little grace and a little <laughs> patience as I continue to move forward because we all start somewhere. And for me, I just need to continue to build up my database. All that being said, I'm never walking away from the residential side. There you go. No, and, I, <laughs> and trust me, I appreciate having one person to contact for either either side of the transactions that we're doing um, because of the value you provide for our customers and the value that having, and I'm going to throw it out there, Carrie Kassane on my, my girl on the residential side, that the value that you pick up the phone and you talk to an escrow officer that has, hell, I don't know how many 
transactions, thousands of transactions under her belt that you can say, hey, this is going on. Have you seen this? And very few times have, has, have I stumped her. She's always been like, hold on, Ed, this is, this is what we need to do, or this is how we can fix this. Because um, we don't know. I mean, when, when we get a listing sometimes, or when we get a, uh, when we get a listing, when we get a buyer, we put it in escrow, we don't know what's on title. We, we, you know, pe and people aren't the most forthcoming, and sometimes they don't even know what's on title. Yeah, I always talk about this idea of experience because you might be the most seasoned real estate agent in Clark County. And let's say that you do 150 transactions in a year. That's pretty solid, right? So a little over 10 transactions per month. Well, Carrie and her team might see 150 transactions a month. And so because of that, they've been through experiences that are going to help you in understanding the nuances of how you're going to be able to overcome the objection that you're facing in order to get the deal done. Your escrow officer and her team by far and away, not even a close second are the most essential uh, uh, partner you have in your team. I like to think that I provide value, um, but let's face it, the value is in the escrow officer and her team. And, and I think that we have the best in the business, uh, but, but I'll stay neutral here for just a second in the sense that I don't care who you are. If you're in real estate, you need partners that you work with closely that go to back for you and help you through the entire process. And at the very top of that pyramid, in, in my opinion, is your escrow staff. Because again, you may know it all, but there's going to come a time where you're going to need to lean on somebody that knows a little bit more about you to get that deal to the finish line. And you need them to have your back. And I love that Carrie Kassane and, and her team, uh, they have your back. They have my back more than anything. Um, but, uh, but that's, but, but that's even to take it one step further, Ed, and forgive me if I'm rambling on here, but it, it talks about partnership and teamwork in the real estate space, whether it's uh, commercial or residential, doesn't matter. You, your wife run an amazing team. You have transaction coordination. You have support staff. You have other people that are part of your team. Your success is directly correlated with you and how you work. But one layer off of that, it's in direct correlation to the team that you surround yourself with. And that's key. I was talking to somebody today about that. And I told them individual agents don't understand that they have to build a team. And when I say build a team, I'm not saying bring agents on or bring a, an admin on. No, you need to build a team. You need to have an inspector that you trust, that you know. You have to have a, t a, a title rep like yourself that you can trust and call. You need to have an escrow officer that you know and trust because that is your team. And that's how you build your business is knowing that, okay, if I get, if I get in a jam, I'm not using John down the street that doesn't know anything. I'm using, you know, John Sanders, been in the business 15 years, Chicago title, been in the business forever. Carrie Kassane, who's done thousands of transactions, does 150, 200 a month. And so I'm confident that if there's an issue, I'm going to know up front, I'm going to know right away, and then I can get it fixed versus, you know, I've, I've had them. I mean, we've done enough transactions in, in this city and in Miami that we've had escrow people tell us, hey, this is going on. I don't know how to fix it. Well, if you don't know how to fix it, how am I going to fix it? <laughs> I think in the years that we've been doing business together, I think I've called you a couple of times and asked you, hey, John, if this comes up, what do we do? And the transaction hasn't even been yours. It's been somebody else's, but they didn't have an answer for me. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, well, and again, that, that comes to our, that speaks to our relationship. And it's not just about hey, Ed, I'm only going to help you out whenever the deal's in my shop. No, not at all. We're way past that. It's it's a, how can I provide value? What questions can I answer for you? Who can I call in my Rolodex that might be able to get a, an answer to a question that you have that, that I can't control, maybe that I don't know? And being in the business for 15, almost 16 years now, uh, I'm very grateful that I've made friends with a lot of people. Many are my competitors, but we have a a great uh, ability to communicate with one another. I help them out. They help me out. And, you know, I, I know it, it speaks to, there's a lot of competition in what we do, me with other companies, you with other people. 
But I guarantee you've worked with many agents that, I mean, yes, I guess you could put them under that, that category of competition. But when you look at it uh, in, a, in, a, in a way of abundance, there's plenty of business to go get. It's not a competition thing. It's just, let, I'm going to go out and get mine just as you are. Um, you, you really get a sense of gratification when you help somebody else out. Um, you don't know how it's going to repay you in the future, but if, if you're able to help somebody, it's going to come back to you. You just don't know how, nor are you really expecting to see it. But uh, I mean, if we all came to what we do purely from a position of how can I help you today, Ed, um, then we're all going to be better for it. Yeah. So, so funny you said that. So I just saw uh, another agent at another company and another team. Um, I saw one of their new agents on his team just closed the deal. So he was bragging on social media and I was like, Hey, way to go. Great job. You know, great job on you building the team and, and getting them along to his first transaction. Um, he commented, Hey, you're the man. My next comment was, you know what? We need to meet for coffee so we could just see and, and collaborate and talk and, and, and just get to know each other because this is a small business and we know we need to work with each other. It's not really, there is enough business and your business isn't going to be somebody else's business. My business isn't going to be somebody else. Everybody has enough business and everybody knows enough. I've called you a bunch of times and said, Hey John, I'm looking for this type of product. Can you call your guys and see if you can find it for me? Yep. And, and that's just the way that it works. It's, you know, how can you deploy all of the, uh, resources at your disposal to help you to help your clients and again if you come from it from a position of just wanting to help you're going to get it back tenfold no doubt about it yep okay last question which is the most important to me what is your favorite place in vegas and when i mean place it doesn't really matter what it is Okay, so th this is a tough question, and I, I, I'm curious to know how many of your guests have actually kind of defaulted with a few answers. But um, my favorite place truly is wherever my wife and daughter are. Um, I'm a, a hugely committed to to my wife and my daughter, love them to death. So um, if, if they're, you know, wherever I maybe don't find too much value in going, but they're there, then I'm good. But I'll tell you this, uh, my favorite place to be uh, – Honest to goodness is at Hope Church Sunday mornings, 845. It's the, the best hour and 45 minutes of my week. I love it. A close second is Dragon Ridge Country Club playing golf with my boys. And then I'm going to round it out with being uh, on my bike on the River Mountain Trail, uh, logging in some miles. So it's a long answer. I gave you four of them. But, uh, man, I sure love Las Vegas. I'm, I'm a, I could not brag enough about my town. I love being here. Well, we really appreciate it. Um, the, the most common answer, it depends on what they do. So I've had a home inspector said, say he loves Henderson because of the views when he's on the roof. Uh, so we've had a bunch of different things. I've had people go to restaurants. Yours is definitely an answer I'd love because family is really important to me. So, yeah, you're right. Any, anywhere family is. Church is important. Golf, we need to talk about that because I need to learn that. <laughs> that part of it. <laughs> and I... Of Vegas. I, I, I'd love to get you out there. I'd love to get you out there. All right, John. Thank you very much, buddy. I really appreciate you being on, and um, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate all you do for us. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it.